here, and we're very glad you are here. My name is Amy Ehrlich, and I'm on the OLLI Program Committee. Today is the second presentation in our fall series, which started with a bang last week when they had the rapid review book session. Um, and it promises to keep being stimulating, informative, and especially entertaining. Next week, for example, Ralph Diamond will be talking about the real true story of the origin of our national park system, which isn't what you might have believed <laughs> at all. <laughs> Okay. Um, but today we have members of SURGE, three members of SURGE, one will be appearing soon. Uh, and SURGE stands for Showing Up for Racial Justice. It's a nationwide organization that moves people into action as part of a multiracial movement using community organization, uh, advocacy, and education. Um, the SURGE members will both explain and demonstrate what they do and what you can do too. So there's going to be interaction here, not just sitting and listening. Um, so a little bit about the presenters. Um, next to me is Penny Patch. And Penny went to work in the Black Freedom Movement in 1962 when she was 18 years old. She was an organizer for the Student um, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, more commonly known as SNCC. And she worked on desegregation and voter registration. She actually registered house to house people to vote who had never voted in their lives um, in Georgia and Mississippi. Um, in that process, she really, it was scary. She was arrested several times and jailed even. Um, Penny has continued to work toward racial justice since she moved to Vermont in 1960. 1970. 1970. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, next to Penny on the left is Allie Johnson Kurtz. She's a facilitator, organizer, and a rebel um, from the Winooski River watershed in central Vermont. She currently works as the communications director for Change the Story Vermont. It's a gender equity initiative to advance women's economic security statewide. In addition to volunteering as a member of SURGE, Ali serves on the steering committee for the Vermont Freedom Bail Fund, El Fondo para la Libertad, Vermont. This is an organization that raises bail funds um, to help free immigrants that are held in detention. Um, so that's... Uh, Oh my goodness, and wait, Sandra Batchelder, who's next to me. Sandra's a grandmother, a gardener, a retired middle school teacher, and an activist. In 2015, she saw a presidential campaign where assault, racist, racist taunts, and mockery were applauded. She was frightened and then determined that the central Vermont community she loves would resist and that she would be part of this resistance. So we have three really wonderful presenters with an awful lot to offer. Um, after they speak, of course, um, they can take your questions. Thanks again. Thank you for having us. So I'd like to give you all an overview of showing up for racial justice, and also so you can better understand the work that we do, and um, know that you are invited into it in an ongoing way. So, showing up for racial justice, Central Vermont uh, is working with a variety of different organizations cross racially uh, to dismantle white supremacy um, here and nationwide. Search is a national network with chapters all over the country um, who hold different accountability relationships with organizations that are POC led, which Penny will talk about um, in a moment. But so that you have a sense of what our work is, we directly support the work of organizations like Minor Justice, Justice for All, uh, the Ethnic Studies Coalition, which is working to get um, greater ethnic studies into schools statewide. 
uh, Black Lives Matter, Greater Burlington, um, and others who are doing racial justice here um, in our area. So we directly support their work by showing up to their events, and sometimes providing child care or food, um, turning out our folks for those events, uh, fundraising for them, and we may pass around, I'm not sure if we'll do this, but we may pass around the, the hat to um, to share funds back to these organizations, which we often do at many of our events. Um, and our events take a wide range of action. So we have uh, practice sessions, which seek, um, seeking out against racial injustice practice sessions, which you'll get a taste of today. Um, we're going to walk you through a little mini practice session, but we hold those on an ongoing basis. And, um, this summer we did a series at the NU Church. Um, we're going to be holding more of those at the NU as well, which you're all invited to. And those are um, a longer form training for you to come and learn about how to speak up when you see your fear racist instance. Um, and I would say that we've probably trained at this point hundreds of Central Vermont community members. Um, folks keep coming back. They're slightly different every time, and there's more to learn. Um, we also do living room conversations because we believe that taking these conversations directly into folks' homes, um, where they can bring in their neighbors and other folks who might not come out to an event, but who would come to their friend or neighbor's house to learn, um, is a critical way that we can uh, increase our impact. So we held living room conversations with folks who wanted to post those um, for a few years now. And um, if you're interested in having a conversation, we can help support you to do that in your home. Um, and they have um, a number of different, they have a number of different focuses. So we look at the Black Lives Matter policy platform. Um, and you can have a conversation about that, some presentation of this material. We can talk about free speech, or free speech. Um, there are six different modules of, of content that we, that we do for those living room conversations. Um, and I, I will pass it over to Penny now to talk about the accountability relationships beyond the showing up to events that we have um, with different PLC people of color that organizations um, in this area. Um, so, so we're, CERC's mission and ours is to, as white people, work within white communities to raise consciousness about racism. Um, another part of our mission, um, as we do this, is to take guidance, and information, but, but really guidance about what is being asked of us from organizations that are led by people of color. If you're in a different part of the country, you will find organizations that are not only led by people of color, but inhabited completely by people of color. Vermont, it's more often that the, the leadership is of color. So, um, so, in order to, to take that, to take guidance from people of color, we work on developing relationships of trust between people. Um, it can be a complex process sometimes, given the racism that exists in, um, in our world. Um, and of course, one thing is, you know, I'm referring to people of color, but there are many kinds of people of color and many opinions about what should be done. So it's not like there's one, one group says do this, and there's another group that says maybe do that. So, um, but as my, as Amy said, um, in my bio, um, between the ages of 18 and 22, back in the ages of, in the time of the Civil Rights Movement, I worked for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And this was a group, um, all, uh, the entire
retired, the leadership was always black. Um, most of our people in our organization were black, and then there were always a very small number of white people who were a part of that. And it happened in my life that I got there at the right moment and participated in this. And so I had the experience of working with brilliant, under brilliant black leadership. Um, which I have found to be one of the great gifts of my life. Um, and it's not something that is given or offered to all white people to experience. So I'm always grateful for that. Um, I'm going to say a little more about the different organizations we support in the state. One is definitely migrant justice. And my guess is any number of you in this room are aware of all the issues around immigration that are going on in the country now and in Vermont. And some of you are participating in mitigating and making change in that situation. Um, so Minor Justice is a dynamic 10-year-old group whose mission um, initially was to support and protect undocumented farm workers working on our Vermont dairy farms. Over time, they still do that, but they have also evolved into um, being an organization that's constantly advocating for farm workers that are being swept up by the Customs and Border Patrol. And that's happening, you know, practically every week in this state now. One a week. One a week, yes. Um, and sometimes there's, a particular, there's been a particular focus on picking off leadership in my new justice also. So we help um, publicize, um, circulate petitions, write to our Congress people, help make the whole issue public. Um, we also contribute money to modern justice. Um, we participate in demonstrations. We have a list of about 250 people whom we can then notify that there's a demonstration in front of the ICE um, office building um, at so and so, you know, at such such a time on such and such a day, and, then, and we help get people there. Um, we make phone calls. We also have collaborated together on film showings, uh, mostly here in Montpelier. Um, um, and, whoops, prejudice spelled out. Okay. <laughs> um, and, one of the things that's going on in Vermont also right now is that Customs and Border Patrol are setting up, they apparently in, this was on, uh, in, the, in the news media and on Vermont Public Radio in the last couple of days that there have been four or five checkpoints um, set up. And, and you know, most of them seem to be up around more hero, um, but to check people's citizenship. Mm -hmm. And and we do, we collaborate with minor justice and help them to do trainings for how to, if we're traveling with undocumented people, how to respond, what people's rights are, what our rights are. Um, and at different ways of responding rather rapidly to these ever evolving situations. Um, and then lastly, there's something called the, which is connected to migrant justice's work, is something called the fair and impartial policing um, policy effort in this, in, in Montpelier right now. And Abby's going to talk a little more about that later and introduce you to that. Um, there's another organization called Justice for All, which is primarily does work involving um, the criminal justice system in Vermont and law enforcement, and um, we uh, support them 
who, as part of a coalition of people and organizations, and we also, um, some of us have testified at legislative hearings, we show up for events, we, you know, we support every way we can. Um, last thing I'm going to say a word about the Ethnic Studies Coalition that just this year succeeded in passing a bill through the Vermont State Legislature that fund, that goes forward on this project of um, doing kind of two things in the, all of Vermont public schools, K through 12. One is do something that they've been trying to do for people have been trying to do for decades, which is decrease the, the bias against students of color. And I'm going to add that this bill encompasses um, LGBTQ young people, also people with disabilities. Um, so this is not only about color, it's about people who are marginalized and struggle um, and they struggle, and the kids struggle in our school systems. And the, the various efforts to educate teachers, administrators, have not been enough. So that's, there's an effort there going forward, as well as to put into the curriculum more of the accurate history of our country, and more about um, all the, the different ethnicities, the difficult history, um, all of these things that most of us, you and me, were not taught in school. Um, and there are other organizations. There will be, Bob's got a whole bunch of handouts there, so you know, as you read, there, there's a whole list of people of color-led organizations in the state with a little bit of information about them, how to contact with them, them if you're interested. Um, and there are going to be other, and there are other handouts. Um, okay, I think, I think I'm done. So we wanted you to not just hear about the work that <clears throat> Serge is doing and others are doing, but also feel some of the way that we try to operate and feel that in your body. Um, and I think part of what makes Serge so special um, is the way that we operate, that when we uh, come together, which we do once every two weeks um, at East Montpelier, uh, at one of our members' farms, we take the time to do a deep check-in and a deep check-out from our meeting. We share food for half an hour, an hour, we have a potluck, and then we meet for two hours. And we do that three-hour extended meeting on a Saturday because we believe that the relationships that are built through that are deeply important and that that is what will sustain our ability to continue to do our work together um, and not get burnt out and tired and you know, give up and leave. Um, but that showing up, listening to one another and hearing what's on our hearts um, is deeply important to that. So I want to bring some of that into the room right now and ask you to turn to your neighbor um, in just a moment and share about the first time that you recognize that you were part of a racialized group, that maybe you recognize that you, know, you were white, that that was, and, and that set up a separation in some way. How did, so just a sec before we get started. Um, so I'm gonna give you each two minutes and then we'll do a switch. But just before we get started, just think for a moment of, you know, go back to that moment and think to yourself about like what, what was that moment or what was, what were one of, one of those moments? Um, and how did that feel for you? Like what came up in your, in your mind, in your body? Like what did, what did that moment feel like? And then share that um, with your partner. And as you're listening, really try to tune into this other person and provide empathy to them. What, you know, feel what, try to feel what they were feeling and um, 
try to deeply understand where they were coming from. I wanted to add um, something about what Alice said about a couple of things about our um, Central Vermont search group. One is the obvious, which is that we're intergenerational, which is, I think, something that most of us find really positive. Um, probably all of us do. But we range in age. I mean, here we have 25 to 75. Um, and then we have all in between, too. Starting off presentations, we notice that actually the land that we're sitting on and the land that we are, we have made our lives on was originally indigenous land. Yeah. Now we're gonna, we're gonna um, do a little, um, very short version of um, what you might experience if you came to a practice session. Um, called, and we run them um, at the Union Church. They'll be going once a month this, um, this uh, winter. And um, that it's called Speaking Up for Racial Justice. And we're gonna do a little exercise which gives you a taste of what you'll be doing there. So the way this will work is we're going to get into groups of three, and I'm going to actually ask you to turn your chairs toward one another so that in your little group of three you can all very easily make eye contact and your bodies are facing one another. One another. Um, and you can hold to do that for just a sec. So in that group of three, you're go each going to have a role. Um, and those three roles are, let's, let's wait to move until I'm done talking, but um, those three roles are um, a repeater, a responder, and an observer. Have you done this before? I not in your head yet. Um, so to remember those roles, we're actually gonna hand out possible sticks once you get into your groups of three that have your role on it, so you'll have that in your hand. Um, and what this is, is we're going to be responding in this little group of three to a biased statement that someone might hear um, out in the world. And this biased statement that we, we chose that you all will be speaking up about, um, I can read it right now. If you're walking down the street and see a young man yell, go back to Africa from a passing car, directed at a preteen child with brown skin. Half an hour later, you see the man at the grocery store. <clears throat> um, and this actually happened to one of our um, surge. Yeah, to one. Yeah. So this, you know, this is not um, far out there. This happened right here in our community, and it might be a situation that you would find yourself in, um, where you see that happen, and then you see this person. You're at Shaw's or whatever in the um, in the parking lot, and you run into this person. So think really deeply about what can you do in that moment, and we're going to try to through the practice, the deeper practice sessions, we really try to give you tools to be able to have confidence in approaching that person and um, your ability to speak up about it. Um, and in here, we're gonna walk you through it in kind of a, a light version. But, um, so the repeater is going to repeat the bias statement, um, and the responder is going to use some tools that Penny's gonna tell us about to formulate a response. Um, to, towards the person who, who said this, who you're seeing. Um, and then the observer is going to remain silent, but notice what's happening. Um, and we're going to give you um, probably three minutes to do that um, interaction. Um, have the person say the bias statement. 
have the responder respond, have the observer observe, and then we're gonna switch roles. So you'll get to go into each of the three roles um, throughout this, this exercise. So we'll do three minutes in each role. Um, we're gonna use the same, the same uh, bias statement for each, um, for each time. So why don't you, uh, I guess Penny is probably, should probably give you some tools to be able to respond first, and then we'll move our chairs and get into it. <laughs> So, um, if you, the question is, how do you interrupt what's going on? How do you also keep yourself safe, um, relatively speaking? Um, and how can you have the most impact? Um, so in this situation, you're actually, you didn't, you saw the situation happen, but there was absolutely no opportunity to do anything right then, so you couldn't interrupt it, um, because the guy just drove on past. Um, so the question is, what are you going to say when you see him in the grocery store? Um, and there are different ways, there are different ways of doing that. You might want to ask them a question. Um, say, I saw this happen, and what was that for you? Why did you engage in that kind of activity? I don't know. Ask a question. That's in, our, in sort of the, the common language of today is called calling in. You know, not immediately going after something, somebody for what they're doing, but bringing them in, trying to bring them in to a conversation. Um, and then another option is to also talk about, educate them about something. Probably not a 15 minute long you know, discourse, but um, a short, you know, give them a little bit of information which they might hear and listen to what they say and reflect it possibly back to them again with another question. These are all kind of techniques that we think about and try and use, and we're all struggling to use them. Well, of course. <laughs> all right. Sandra's got um, popsicle sticks. She's going to give three to each group of three, and then we'll start. Let's go ahead and move your chairs into groups of three. Watch what's going on and, and take some 
know about it. Um, so I'm going to put three minutes on the clock, and whoever has the repeater stick and uh, the speaker stick can begin with that. Um, are there any questions before I start? We've already done it, so we switch. We did it. Did, it, did every group already do one round? No, we didn't. We're close. No, so um, let's do it one more time, and then we'll switch. So even if you already did it, do it again. You can practice it. If you already did it, just practice saying a different thing. Take a different strategy in responding to what was said. So you can practice taking a different tack and, and see what happens. Everybody, yeah. I think it's a really long way between the initial you 
confronting the person and saying something to the whole idea of educating. I mean, that mm -hmm. has that road could be very complex, mm -hmm. and I don't know that you can have that result in that kind of a situation. Maybe you back up from that and. What, what would be an outcome that's not necessarily education in that kind of setting? Yeah. I don't know. Great question. Yeah. Um, something that each person in my group did that I thought was a good idea was to own my own discomfort rather than accusing the other person mm -hmm. and to invite them to tell me, you know, what, what they think. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, after agreeing to talk about it at all, yeah. I mean, to invite them to tell me. And that gives you an idea of whether there is a next step that you can take. Okay. We could well, just keep going. Mary thought maybe, first, uh, was that maybe it was a good idea to say, uh, use the mic. Did you feel, did you, yeah, did you th uh, think what it felt like to be? That person hearing that. What, what would it, you know? Did, did, did you think that? I'm interested. What would it be like to be on the receiving end of that? And several people in our, well, we had three. Um, we all agreed that maybe it's good to get the person thinking about the other person, what it feels like. to me 
and looking at the exercise is addressing some concern to the kid. What, how did that kid feel when that man shouted out? And maybe that's another issue that kind of has to be included. Indeed. And yes, <laughs> absolutely. And the, the child and subsequently her parents and the people were in contact with me and connections were made, but it's very difficult. Yes. So. Yeah, you're, you're, you're fine for another 10 or 15 minutes. 
for questions. It's time for questions anyway. Yeah. So I think that's where we should go. So we have distances for Montpelier residents. Yeah, so I want to, um, let's open it up for questions. Maybe, uh, Bob, if you could pass the mic around as people yeah, ask sure. questions. Sure. And um, I want to just open this up not just for questions about the No Fully Needed campaign, although I welcome those, um, but also about um, our the surge work as a whole and anything that you learned today. So we'll stick around maybe until... As long as you want to. I'm going to just uh, respond to a question, I think, uh, from you, Phyllis. Is this only Montpelier? And the answer is no. Uh, if, if you um, are a Barry resident, Barry City resident, um, there has been work. Uh, uh, we're working to get a fair and impartial policing policy passed in Barry also. Um, you didn't answer my question. Okay. Okay. As someone who follows the news quite closely, I know there's been a lot going on down in Hartford mm -hmm. and White River, and actually the Muslim woman who came up here, she spoke to our group here um, upstairs. Some of us may remember that she came and talked about the hijab and you know the whole thing of why she wore it and all. Uh, so did they actually pass it in Hartford or did they pass over it? That's what I wanted to know. Um, so, as Penny mentioned, this is a statewide campaign and different towns are taking it up all over the state. Uh, Hartford is probably the furthest along of any of the towns. And their city council resisted, resisted, resisted. Um, and they ended up putting it out to um, a vote to be taken by the town as a whole on town meeting day. So, if you're interested in getting involved down there, there's a huge effort right now to educate the community in advance of that vote, um, which I, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle, but but I think that it's a winnable campaign, and um, yeah. So, and the woman who um, is leading on that campaign, her name is Esma Alpini. Yes. Um, she is a lovely dear person. I'm so glad to be doing this. I've worked with migrant justice and there were problems all along. Um, and I went to one city council meeting based upon an email I'd gotten, and they, it was not on the schedule. Has it been rescheduled? Um, Um, so we'll let you know when it is rescheduled. We don't have a date set right now. Yeah, and the, yeah. So we want to be able to take the time to really have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the counselors um, before we before we get to there. So we have met with all the counselors, but um, we feel that like, more of those one-on-one -on -one meetings are needed. Right. Oh, yeah. I just want to add that Winooski has passed this, um, has passed a, an ordinance um, in, their, in their city uh, for fair and impartial policing. So when we take it to our different towns, um, we refer to that uh, policy and, um, and ask that um, the same policy or similar one be enacted in our um, communities. to know what I'm talking about. So I'd like to come somewhat prepared. Um, can you briefly describe what, if any, policy exists in Montpelier, if nothing exists, what the usual actions of police are, and what specifically the ordinance would change? Yeah. I have a one pager that I think you will be very interested in reading. Um, I don't have one now, but if you give your email, I can send it to you. Yeah, so if you sign up over there. But I think that, um, yeah, the, the most important pieces to know are that Montpelier does have, um, they adopted the statewide fair and impartial policing policy. 
So in 2016, Migrant Justice was able to pass at the statewide level a fair and impartial policing policy that was one of the strongest in the nation. Um, really groundbreaking legislation. In 2017, the Vermont State Police um, came back and dismantled pieces of that. Um, and then that weakened policy was adopted, was supposed to be adopted statewide by every town. Many towns still are out of compliance with the law and have not yet adopted the statewide policy. Um, but Montpelier has. So the problem here is that there are several loopholes in the current policy that need to be closed. And that's why we're advocating for the New Holy Negro updated ordinance, is because we need a stronger policy than the statewide policy. And when you see did close these loopholes, and so the really important ones to know are there are four main loopholes, and just make sure that I can remember all of them. But number one, um, the current policy allows our Montpelier police station to be used as a holding cell. If anyone um, is brought in on immigration-related charges, the Montpelier police could hold someone until ICE or Border Patrol detention agents come um, and pick them up. And so we don't want our local police station to be used that way. Um, right now, victims and witnesses of crimes are not protected. So for example, if someone who's undocumented sees a crime happen and they report it, as we would want them to be able to do, their undocumented status could be shared with immigration agents, um, which puts them at deep risk and puts our community at risk because people may not be reporting things that um, otherwise should be. Uh, so the victims, the, the holding cells, um, and see it's been a minute since I've looked at this, and I, I do want to share those two are those two are really critical. I know. I'm, it's failing. Oh, um, also we want to make sure that um, there cannot be a presumption that someone has um, that someone has cro uh, immigrate, immigrated here illegally. That rather that to um, send someone to immigration agents, they would actually have to see evidence of border crossing, not just rely on their, essentially their assumption that someone had crossed the border, because that can open up all kinds of, um, all kinds of ways that people could be reported. To. Profile. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we want to put into the ordinance that you would need to actually see someone, essentially see someone cross the border to be able to say that they were suspected of border crossing. And there's one more that I will send you in the, on the one page or one, one idea. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't there something in the law that if, they, if somebody commits a crime that they have to report it to the, mm, or is that part of the loophole thing? Not sure. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Sorry. Um. And if, if a person is found guilty of a crime that there is some kind of federal regulation or state that they have to then report them to the feds. Yes, so this does not protect folks if they have a criminal, if, if like they do something criminal. But for example, with um, like if someone stopped for a DUI, that's not a criminal charge, and that should be the same for any person. They shouldn't end up getting deported because they got a traffic violation of some kind. Um, and we've been seeing that, you know, civil, civil um, infractions, infractions <laughs> thank, you, thank you, are ending up with people being deported. Um, I wanted to thank you for the chance to practice. <laughs> and I also noted how uh, nervous and a little bit frightened we were when we had to um, imagine confrontations, and I really appreciate your modeling that when you see uh, it, it's not an infraction, but when you see a lapse of inclusion, um, and I, and what it reminded me that one of the hardest things times I ever spoke up was at a little league game with my neighbors and people who were being unsportsmanlike, and I spoke up with my friends and neighbors, and it was really hard. And it reminds me that we have to practice courage every day in order to have it when we need it. And I appreciate the model. Thank you. 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 Thank
I think we can do one more question. And, and I'm get mine in. Okay. But I'm, 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 the observation that you made when we excluded Todd, mm -hmm. it was for me a great example of how those, I'm oversimplifying, those of us in power don't even notice yeah. when we're using that power. Last question. Thank you, Thank you for that word on courage. Whites must have courage to correct things. Okay, I have a question. Um, institutional racism. Um, I was instrumental in getting the migrant workers to be able to get licenses after driving them to the state house for many times, and then going and turning in my license, as did others, and saying, we want one like they are going to get, and getting the system to work a little there was resistance, um, and now there is at least one case of a person at motor vehicles who reported when a person with what they said was a southern sounding name getting a license, and they immediately told race who went and picked them up based on their new legal license. This is such a horrible systemic racism action in our town. I want to know what's happened. That was two, three years ago, and I have not heard of the punishment for that crime. So Minor Justice and the ACLU sued because not just that single action of someone being picked up, but the DMV agents were systematically handing over those records to immigration agents. And so they filed a lawsuit two years ago, and that case is still being worked out um, as the courts take their time. Um, and I think it's important to note that if, if you drive and you're able to get a driver's privilege card rather than a driver's license, I have one. I hope that you get one, too. It's powerful to be adding names that you know would not be profiled. Um, to that to that roster and for police officers if you get stopped to be seeing those my partner went to the dmv and asked for a driver's privilege card my partner is white um, and was issued a driver's license mm -hmm. after checking the box for a driver's wow. privilege card so you do have to be quite diligent um, in so the, the driver's privilege card even if you don't have um, citizenship status you can get a driver's privilege card rather than a license, which gives you the legal right to drive, uh, but it's not a federal identification, it's not related right. to you know having to have a passport or um, citizenship. So my partner, who is a citizen, um, went to ask for a driver's privilege card, but was issued a driver's license. And so I do highly recommend that you get a driver's privilege card in solidarity with migrant folks who need the right to be able to drive. Um, but you have to be very diligent when you go to the DMV to make sure that they give you the right thing. Because even if you ask for a privilege card, they may see a white face and give you a license. And they also ask questions that aren't legal. They say, you must have your birth certificate, which is not true. Because they try to give the run around to anybody who's really trying to do that.